courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and this week I sound pretty much like the Flames have been playing recently. Hope you're doing better this week, Matt. Yeah, well, uh, at least I, my throat isn't... Uh, I don't sound like a completely different person, so... Uh, the Flames, yeah. it, it is what it is. Yeah, I've been sick all week, and I'm trying to kick it, but it's tough. So, you know, may, maybe it's one of these things where I'm cursed. Like, when the Flames get better, I'll get better. Who knows? I haven't been feeling too good since the start of the year. Well, I hope that you feel better soon. Anyway, now let's get back to talking about the great week of Flames hockey. The Flames played three games this week. The first game this week was against the team that we've never seen before, and it was weird looking at the all-time... Uh, series between these two teams because it was 0-0-0 and the Flames played for the first time ever, the Vegas Golden Knights this is a game going into it I thought the Flames might have had a chance on, I thought the Flames played the better game for 58 minutes and then well, as we all know the, the wheels fell off the cart There's not really much you can say about this game the Flames were playing the best team in the league and had the lead until the last minute and change of the hockey game and one mistake happened on the ice then a mistake happened off the ice and then another mistake happened on the ice and then another mistake happened on the ice and that was the ball game yeah I mean I was pretty happy with how the Flames had played up until those last two minutes it was good hockey they were controlling the pace for a lot of this game I thought a lot of guys were having a good night and all of a sudden the fro leak I'm not really going to call it the own goal but he pretty much uh, put one in a great position. Yeah, have. yeah. Well, I think that was just some miscommunication between Hamilton and Smith. I think that Smith thought Hamilton was going to grab it, and I think Hamilton thought Smith was, and that little hesitation of "oh shit," and then yeah, <laughs> not much you can do about that, but. It does happen, and every once in a while you have a bad mistake like that, and the mistake that happened off the ice was not taking the time out right there, just to, like, okay, we were having a good game, and let's just settle down, get to overtime, get a point, and then sort things out in the extra time. And instead, right off the face-off, defensive breakdown, big time, and then, uh... Yeah, the second goal 10 seconds later, and there you go, game over. Yeah, I was really surprised they didn't take a timeout. You could tell the guys were rattled. Yeah, you could well, tell it, the players just needed that, you know, that timeout to refocus and keep going. Yeah, and you could tell that uh, sometimes when you have a very catastrophic mistake like that, where. Like, it was just one where, like, everybody was confused at what happened. That That's an instance where you need to just take a timeout. Just like, okay, yeah, that happened. Great, awesome, yay. And carry on and just go on with your day. Yeah, it was just, I guess it was sad because the Flames played so much of that game so well. It always sucks when you're that close to then end up, you know, losing. And and not just by one, by a couple. Yeah, and a testament to Vegas, they're, they've they been a gutsy team, and they do capitalize on other teams' mistakes rather effectively, which is good coaching and just generally being clutch, sort of like Calgary was a couple years ago when they made the playoffs in 2014-15. So now having seen Vegas play sort of for the first time against the Flames, I watched it as well what do you think about that Vegas team they're overperforming for how good of a team they are but like Calgary that one year they're riding the wave and that I don't expect it to continue beyond this season but they should make the playoffs they probably will win the first, the first round but I don't see them having a deep, deep run. And I, I could see them getting upset depending on who they face in the first round. I'm kind of thinking this might be our Cinderella team for the year. 
Yeah, I don't see them like going to the conference finals or winning the cup or anything like that. Like it, they're not. They're more opportunistic than well built, if that makes sense. Well, and in the playoffs, you need a deep roster, and they're going to get some injuries, and they don't have anyone to replace those guys. The only way I can see them going deep is if they make some sort of a big acquisition at the deadline. Which, I'm not sure they want to be in sale mode right now. Yeah, well, they could do that. And because of uh, McPhee's acquiring of draft picks and all that last year uh, with the expansion draft, they do have extra assets that they could parlay into actual depth. But it's one of those, do they want to go all in in the first year? They could. And it wouldn't be shocking if they did, but... It, it, I think they, they'd probably be better off organizationally if they just stood pat and let things develop over years. The next game of the week, the Calgary Flames had a rematch against the Tampa Bay Lightning, who we beat, what, 5-1 last time we played them? And in this game, the Lightning ended up uh, coming back and getting their revenge on the Flames, scoring seven goals against the Calgary Flames. I thought in this one... The teams looked good for about the first two periods. I thought they were pretty even. And then whatever it was, the Lightning just took off in that last period. Well, this is another one where the, it falls a bit on the coaching staff. And Mike Smith, on the first goal, that was a, not a goal that should have been allowed. That Coburn the, goal? Yeah. The second one, that was iffy. The third one was iffy. The fourth one was terrible, and it's like, why is he still in net at that point? Like, the 12 seconds into the third period, like, you just gave up the lead. Just pull the goalie. Like, it's, Riddick has done well, and if your starter has given up four bad goals, I would have pulled him after the third one, but especially the fourth one. Like, that's a backbreaker right off the bat, 12 seconds into the third period. Like, that yeah, just gave is. everything to Tampa, and then they just kept rolling in 7-4. And that was... Honestly, the Flames played a good enough game that they should have won that one. And they... It was bad coaching, frankly. A bad coaching decision that allowed the goaltender to cost the Flames the game. And that's not saying that Smith's a bad goalie. Everybody has a bad game. Like, Kipper had bad games where he'd give up five or six and, you know, he'd come back the next night and, like Smith did against Chicago, and played well. But you also have to have that situational awareness of, hey, my guy doesn't have it tonight. And it's never nice to pull the goalie, but he doesn't have it. So get the other guy in there and maybe you can salvage a point or two out of it. And... Instead, the Flames walk away with zero in a game that they should have won. Yeah, I mean, they did put Riddick in, but they did it too late. He got uh, about 13 and a half minutes of play time in that one. And I think, honestly, Matt, this may have been a case of Mike Smith just having played too many games so far. I he's agree. Played, he's played 44 games so far, and the Calgary Flames have played 52 total. So that's a lot of the season have played by February. Oh, I know. And, like, realistically, he should not have been playing more than on pace to play 60 games. And at, at the end, beginning of March, he might get close to that. Like, it, it, it's just not sustainable, especially with the next few weeks where the Flames are playing basically every other day or back-to-backs. Like, you can't just ride the one guy. You need to have the other goaltender available and playing well enough to actually spell Smith instead of just riding the one guy in hopes that he limps over the finish line at the end of the season in a playoff spot. Well, and also have the confidence too, like you said, either start the other guy or say to yourself, you know what, it's just time to put him in mid-game. Mm -hmm. And that's not being unfair to Smith. Like, he's been the Flames' best player for the vast majority of the season, but everybody has a bad game every once in a while. That's not on him. No, it's it's tough when you're playing that much hockey. And, I mean, you know, the goalie doesn't get shifts off like the other players do. They're on the ice the whole 60 minutes. So 
He's he's an older guy too. We got to remember the Smith is 35. If he was 29 or 30, you might be able to ride him more. But he's getting up there as far as goalie ages. Yeah, and I, I you know it's one of those situations where because of the fact that they only have him for one more year, and I'm kind of assuming that the Flames aren't planning on extending him beyond that. The teams are looking to use him sort of like uh, teams in baseball use relievers that they acquire at the trade deadline where they just burn the guy out and just throw him in any high leverage situation even if he doesn't have rest because who cares he's going to free agent anyway so I'm getting my usage out of him and who cares and I think the Flames are kind of treating Smith unfairly in that manner where they're just burning him out and without real deference to him or the Flames' future. Because, like, next season, if Smith's burnt out from this year, like, he could be legitimately bad, in which case the Flames are going to have difficulties because of that. Well, I said to you when we acquired him, I can see them using Smith as a starter this year and then using him as the back backup mentor next year to either Riddick or Gillies or whoever they decide is the next heir apparent for the net. And I could see that as well. You know, you don't want to go with, say, a Gillies-Riddick pairing because you don't have that veteran guy there. So I think that they're trying to get all they can out of him this year and the next year maybe play him in 30 games. Is that, okay, kid, you're getting st- shelled. Let's put Smitty in and he'll clean up your mess. Yeah, I could see that as well. And if you look at most young goalies around the league, they usually have that veteran backup who's been around the block a few times. Mm-hmm. Well, the good news of the week, the third and final game before the Flames leave on their home stand, the Calgary Flames played the Chicago Blackhawks, a team not doing too well this year, and ended up winning this one 4-3 to three in overtime. Of course, Sean Monaghan gets the overtime goal, gets the win for the Flames. Uh, Michael Froelich scored his first goal since coming back from his injury, and Matt Stajan on a two-game goal streak after this. Who would have thought we'd hear that? <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of surprising. Um, I'm I mean, glad to funny. see. I'm glad to see he's good actually hitting the net and getting some points on the board. It's good for yeah, him it's, anyway. It's only his third goal of the year. Yeah. Interesting note on the lineup here: Jankowski was scratched for this game, um, and Mangiapane put into the lineup in his spot, and Hathaway was demoted to the fourth line in this one. So, some odd decisions there. I have to assume Jankowski wasn't well for them to scratch him, but it seems like an odd decision, doesn't it, Matt? Well, uh, frankly, Jankowski, his line has been struggling for most of the month of January, so I can kind of understand giving him a night off, let him see how he's doing, and, like, get him to see one from upstairs, and it can't hurt. Sometimes you just need to step away and take another fresh perspective on things and carry on. So the Flames lose six in a row, um, you know, and then beat Chicago. You and I had said earlier in the year the Flames can't afford a uh, six-game losing streak or even more than five. If we take a look right now, the Flames are at 60 points, and that puts them two teams out of the wild card, only one point out of the wild card, but two teams. What are your thoughts right now on where we have the Flames and what situation they've got themselves into? Like, realistically, the Flames could have like a 14 game winning streak or whatever yeah 14 games that's pretty it, optimistic well if they had not blown so many leads because each of the games that they lost on the six game road trip or losing streak they had leads in them and if they would have just had the fortitude to not surrender leads late in the game then they would have had more points. And, like, the Flames could legitimately be up near the top of the standings. But instead, they made uh, quite a number of mistakes over that stretch, and they are where they are. And until this team gets some mental fortitude, I don't know where this team is going to end up. They, on paper, they should be good. But... Yeah, you thought going into this season, and even during the season, this was a Stanley Cup contender team. Yeah, but they also have to realize that just because you have talent 
mean doesn't mean that it's going to be given to you. You have to actually go out and earn the wins and earn the two points every night and earn the playoff victories. It's not going to be handed to you. Like, look at the Oilers. Everybody expected them to be just awesome. You know, they're going to win the Cup this year. And it got into their heads, and they faced a little bit of adversity, and then they crumpled. Well, Calgary, it's looking very much the same way, not to the same extent, because the Flames are deeper than the Oilers. But there's no excuse for the fact that the Flames are as bad as they are. They should be better than they are. But right, they're right getting now, in their I can't own way. see the Flames winning four best of seven series. Honestly, at this point, I don't see them winning a playoff series. Because they're not showing that they have the resolve to actually do what needs to be done in order to win. And when you give up six wins, basically, because of stupidity... Yeah, because a lot of the losses were just dumb mistakes that it cost them. What do you do? This is not an easy league to win in. Every team is good. So you have to do all the little things each game. It's not, you can't take nights off and expect two points. And you can't take periods off and expect two points. Like the Flames heading into the third period in most of the games had the lead and they just needed to keep doing what they were doing but they sat keep back foot on the gas they sat back the other team gets a little bit of momentum going then they crumple and they get a couple of points from the overtime losses but that doesn't really help you much I think the flames might be able to muster up one playoff series at this point maybe but I mean, and, yeah, and it would have to be a fortunate opponent. Like, it, like it, if they were playing a depleted Sharks team or something like that, where, and it would probably be a seven-game series. <coughs> yeah, I, I think they might be able to do it if they get lucky, but there's no way I see this team, I mean, no. with what we're seeing right now, going to the Cup, and it's no. too late, I think, to turn things around. No, and realistically, this team needs several pieces to be altered in order for the team to take those next steps. And it's unfortunate, but the team does need a shakeup. So at this point, what is a successful season for the Calgary Flames, based on where we're at right now? Making the playoffs. I uh, agree with you. Like, frankly, if they make miss the playoffs, then uh, management, a lot of it has to get changed. Just due to the fact that you know, like, that's just simply unaccept unacceptable. And even in with the Oilers, frankly, uh, with their embarrassment of a season, they should be firing basically everybody, too. But, you know, I say that every year. But, you know. Well, they things, did a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, they, you know, dumb things happen. And the well, Islanders have... another former Oiler in Paul Coffey. So how yeah. much they love their veterans. Yeah, well... The Islanders are very happy for their second line. <laughs> yeah, well, and I mean, you know, the Islanders is a good team to mention because the Flames don't make the playoffs. We hand potentially a very good draft pick to the Islanders. Oh, I know. And, like, my disaster scenario is the Flames winning the draft lottery from missing the playoffs and handing the Islanders Rasmus Dolan. And, like, that would just be, yeah, why not? Sure. <laughs> You know, like the Flames, that's why they really do need to make the playoffs, just so that they don't <coughs> have like a Tyler Sagan moment like the Leafs did. Yeah, no, I agree. At this point, if we miss the playoffs, I think heads are going to roll for, you know, right or wrong. I think they have to. Yeah. And that's not to say that Treleving and the rest of them have not done a good job. They're, they've done a great job in my book. It's just. You have certain expectations. If you mit fail the, to reach them by a staggering manner, then it is what it is. Yeah, you're paid to put a competitive team on the ice. You didn't do your job for whatever reason, so we need someone else to come in and try to do it. Yeah, and it's not to say that this isn't fixable. Like Realistically, if the Flames were to trade a defenseman for a scoring right <coughs> winger of some sort, I think that would go a long way to fixing a lot of the problems, especially with Rasmus Anderson playing so well in Stockton. 
the step down from whichever guy you trade to Anderson's not going to be a, a huge drastic difference compared to the upgrade that you get up front. I but, think it'll help, but I don't necessarily think that making a deal like that between now and the deadline propels this team deep in the playoffs. No, but it helps step things in the right direction, and I think that's where the Flames are going to have to go, whether they make the playoffs, miss the playoffs, whatever. Like, heading into next season, that has to happen. Yeah, and, I don't know if it has to happen at the deadline, but I think it has to happen before next, you know, the start of next season. Yeah, because uh, we have too many good defensemen at all levels of the system. Valimaki's doing great in uh, Tri-Cities, I think. And we have enough good young defensemen. We need to start moving them up the ladder. And when you have really good defense, really good defense prospects, you can use them to get the things that you need. And getting a scoring right winger would definitely help the situation. Speaking of right wingers, you're a big fan of Garnet Hathaway, and we saw him in the Chicago game move to the fourth line. He's been playing on that third line with Ben and Jankowski, and he's now playing with Stajan and Lazar. I know a lot of people like Jank or like Hathaway. I mean, he's you know a fun guy to watch. He's he's a bit of a sandpaper player, but I honestly think this guy and fans have been saying, oh, he shouldn't be down there. I think he's peaked as a fourth line winger. I think that's going to be his role going forward. Uh, so do I. Uh, he's a good young player. He's a physical guy, but expecting him to score a lot or at all is probably asking too much. And he he's really there to get under the other team's skin, provide that sandpaper, fight occasionally, and that's about it. Yeah, there's one of those guys that is, I think he got the job because he's, you know, he's good and he had a good season in the AHL. Um, he just looked good when he was here previously, and he's cheap. And I think this will be one of those guys that they keep around on the team until he's making a million bucks, and then they find this younger version of Garnet Hathaway on the farm. Yeah, a good parallel would be a guy like Derek Dorsett. Just a smart, all-around pain in the butt type of player to play against and that's about it yeah i mean he's also 26 and people are gonna say well that's young but if you think about prospects making their way in the nhl that's an older guy to be you know getting that call up and uh, really playing his first nhl season oh definitely and um, he needs to stick at the nhl level and show that he can stick at the nhl level even if it's just in the fourth line role and see how it goes do you think that we have a better chance of having Hathaway or Lomberg stick around? Uh, I'd have to go with Hathaway, but Lomberg could easily replace him. It just depends on fit. But I think that Lomberg, because of his height, might be at a slight disadvantage because they both play the same way, but Lomberg's only like 5'9", so it does make a little difference. Lomberg's also a little more expensive, believe it or not. Yeah. He's making seven hundred thousand to Garnet Hathaway's six fifty. Um, I don't know. I'm still not sold on Lomberg at the NHL level. I've seen him a few times play. I think he might be your next Freddie Hamilton, that extra forward. But I just can't see this guy having a regular spot in the Flames lineup. No, and plus the Flames need to, in order to have a viable recruitment tool. They need to, like, okay, they signed Hathaway, they signed Juris before, they signed Lomberg, they've signed Spencer Fu. They need to show that if you sign with us and you play well, you'll get a shot in the NHL. And really, I think that's part of why Lomberg was chosen, was that, hey, they are playing well, Hathaway and Lomberg, and previously Juris, they did a good enough job. They're getting a shot. And that way they can go and sell to the next bunch of guys that say, hey, we will give you a spot if you play well. And if it's up to you. If you do well, you stay. If you don't, we move on. But at least we're going to give you a shot. And with each of those players, they got a shot. And that's the important thing. Well, I think especially for the next couple of years where the Flames are lacking high-end draft picks, 
being able to recruit those college players is going to be more important than ever. Yeah, and you can even see that with Riddick uh, bringing him in. And I'm sure that if Preble was playing well, that he'd get a shot too, just for that same manner, because they can sell it to the European free agents, of which there are a number that the Flames are going after. And with the Flames' lack of draft picks this year, you'd have to figure that they're going to be looking to get a, a handful of free agent guys just to offset the lack of picks that they have. So that way they're basically getting the same number of guys that they would in the draft, even though they only have, like, I think three picks right now. Yeah, it depends, on a, it depends if we make the playoffs or not. There's a few conditions on those picks. Yeah, that's why I'm not 100% sure yet. So one other roster move. Uh, the Flames sent Andrew Mangiapane back down to Stockton and recalled Merrick Hrivik before the road trip. I think there's a good move. We talked a little bit about it last week. I think Mangiapane needs to play right now. I think he needs, you know, top six minutes, and he can get those in Stockton. I agree. Hervik, I think, again, is Her- Hervik is topped out as a bottom six guy, and he's more flexible. He can play center. He can play wing. So it makes more sense to carry him on the road. Yeah, I agree. And with Froelich being back, it makes more sense just to have him as the spare forward instead of Mangiapane just eating popcorn instead of red yeah and i mean horrific is 26 as well so this is another guy who i think you have to decide do we re-sign him next year or not and i don't think he goes back to the a i think he either comes back as an nhl player even that extra forward or you send him on his way yeah and it's basically like the Derek grant signing from a few years ago just somebody that can fill in it in a pinch but if you don't have him on your team anymore you're not really going to lose any sleep over it Everybody's got a Merrick Hrivik. Yeah, exactly. So an interesting note is Hrivik cleared waivers earlier in the year. He's waiver eligible again after 12 more days in the roster. So the road trip is pretty much 12 days long. So he'll probably, I don't know if they'll put him back on the on the uh, waiver wire after, but I think he'll stick with the Flames for the rest of the year. Yeah, and, and they <laughs> could. I, yeah, I... Either way, I don't see anybody claiming him if they had to re-put him on waivers. No, I just think at this point his he's better spent as a F- NHL player. I agree. Well, Matt, there's some interesting news from our friend of the show, Ryan Pike. Ryan Pike has been looking at uh, some of the scouting reports. For those that don't know, when you go to the press box and he rink, they say who's there, and you can see a list of what scouts are where. So it's kind of neat when you go to a Flames game in the press box, you can see what scouts are there. And, read into what you want but the Flames have been sending some of their best scouts to Ottawa lately on January 21st when Ottawa played Boston assistant GM Craig Conroy went February 1st Ottawa versus Anaheim uh, our director of pro personnel Derek McKinnon went February 3rd Don Maloney went and February 4th Chris Snow and David Johnson went for the Flames to have been really to five games or four games in uh in two weeks to the Ottawa Senators, you know that they've got to be watching a few different players. You know they're probably interested in doing a deal with the Senators. And Matt, you were saying before the show why you think the Senators are a perfect dance partner for the Flames. Well, you have to look at the Senators, and they're having a terrible season for their standards because they did were like one goal away from being in the Stanley Cup Finals last year. And they're not ready to rebuild, but they do need to shake things up. And because the Flames are also needing to shake things up, there could be some overlap. And they suffer from the same problem that the Flames do in that they have a 37-year-old goaltender. The difference is they have no prospects that are viable replacements for them. So they're like the Flames are lucky that they have Riddick, Gillies and Parsons and Mason McDonald who's still a project but a viable prospect in his own right and Ottawa doesn't really have any of that so there is some need there and Ottawa also has problems on their defense so there is some convenient overlap where the Flames have some things that Ottawa needs and Ottawa has some things that Calgary needs and the names that have been bounced around are Hoffman, uh, Zach Smith, and even Eric Carlson. And 
with the amount that the flames are sending scouts and that to Ottawa, one would have to think that you're not just looking at a guy like Zach Smith. And I'd expect if a trade were to happen, it's going to be a bigger size deal. And it is possible due to the fact that the Flames have such a large amount of defensemen that are good and viable NHL-ready defense prospects that there could be a way that the Flames could do a deal around Eric Carlson and Hoffman and Smith. But that would be, you know, a bit of a <laughs> blockbuster to say the least. I think you'd be shaking up both rosters way too much if you did that. Yeah, you would. But it, it would depend on a lot of things. It, it's one of those weird situations where Calgary has a lot of what Ottawa needs and Ottawa has a lot of what Calgary needs. So it's one of those weird situations where there is some overlap there. Do I honestly expect anything anywhere near that? No, of course not. I think that you're more likely looking at a deal of, say, like a Troy Brower for Zach Smith type trade, like, and other parts, maybe. But that that would be about it. And, like, if you look, uh, Ottawa has done some creative deals in the past, like the FNUF one, where they shed some mediocre contracts in the short term for the longer term bigger contract in Dion Phaneuf. And finding a way to get a second from us for Lazar? Yeah. So it's one of those could something major happen? Definitely. It's just will it? I don't know. It it would be a steep price to pay. Like I would expect, like if the Flames were to land Carlson, you're looking at at least TJ Brody or Dougie Hamilton, and some other pieces. And yeah, it just really depends. I I don't know. And with the fact that uh, Carlson's a free agent after next season, and their rift with the ownership. Uh, that the Carlson camp, I think that he's more likely to get traded anyway, whether it's to Calgary or otherwise. So the fact that Calgary has a whole bunch of legitimate options to choose from that could step in and fill a large portion of Carlson's role on the Senators, I think that's where there's some overlap. Like it, looking at like a Weber for Subban type trade, like a Carlson first Hamilton plus or something like that. Yeah, I just don't know if we need to acquire another expensive defenseman who has a short contract. Yeah, well, you'd definitely extend him afterwards. If he wants to extend, you never know. Yeah, well, I think you'd have that like a written agreement before any deal like that would take place. To me, as much as I think it'd be fun to bring Carlson in with the defensive core we have, and we always talk about how we need to make a move to bring say an Anderson in, I'm not sure trading a piece to bring in another piece and still have a log jam there is the best thing for the Flames. Yeah, well that's why like if you're looking at a larger deal, like say uh, if you break it down into two trades, say Hamilton for Carlson that being deal one and deal two being Brody for Hoffman you know, with other secondary parts moving around to make the cap hits work and all that kind of stuff that could be viable, and that would allow you to bring Anderson up and shake everything up. But it, I again, just think that Hoffman is going to be one of the biggest assets available at the deadline, and I think it's going to take a King's Ransom to get him because there's going to be a bidding war. Yeah, and that's why I think Brody, if a Hoffman deal goes down, I think Brody would be what would have to go the other way. The other name that Ryan Pike has brought up is Jean-Gabriel Peugeot, who's 25. I like he Peugeot a, a lot. He has a bit of a heavy uh, cap hit at $3.1 million, but he's signed um, through 2019-2020, and he's younger, and I think that could be the way to go here. Yeah, he's a, a smaller, feisty player, and he's clutch in the playoffs. So he has multiple playoff hat-tricks. He's not going to blow you away. He's just a very good third-line player. Like, think of Michael Froelich in terms of 
overall level of play. Like, just a good overall two-way guy. Chip in 30 to 40 points, but can score when you need to. For me, I think that Smith is just a left-handed Troy Brower, and I'm not, I think they're going to want a prospect for him. I'm not sure I want to give up a prospect of any level to get another Troy Brower-like player. No, Um, and and I agree uh, with you there. I think that only would be in the deal if, like, you're making a big deal. And, like, I think Brower would be going the other way in that trade, just due to cap hits and all that. But, yeah, I don't see the need to trade Brower for for him, though. No, but, like, if you're making a big deal just to make the dollars work getting Smith for Brower, yeah, maybe. just because the Flames would be saving a little bit of money there, and because uh, Carlson makes more than Brody or Hamilton, just offsetting the dollars to make it work. It's sort of like the FNUF trade where they traded a bunch of mediocre stuff just to get the dollars to work for that season. Yeah, we'll see what happens. The interesting thing to think about there is we know Trill Living from the past likes to get his business done about 10 days before the deadline, and we're three weeks out now, so this is a deal we could see come down any time here. Yeah, like I'm expecting it if it's a big deal, it's going to probably be on the sooner side than later. Yeah, he likes to get his deals done early, A, because he gives the team more time to gel, but B, because then he's not playing the bidding wars. Mm-hmm. I think but, if it were to happen, it would be during the six-game road trip, too. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It could be. Um, yeah, definitely could be. I think, I mean, you got to get done when the other team's ready to deal. And I think there's still a couple teams that are trying to figure out if they're in or out before they want to make much of a deal. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking if we're going to be anywhere close to Ottawa, but we're... Not really. New York and New Jersey is the closest we're going to be. Uh Well, Matt, uh, I think that's about it for the week. If we looked back at last week, the poll of the week that we asked Flames fans was how do the Flames fare in February? We had a split for the top vote. 40% of respondents said the Flames fall into a hole, play less than 500 hockey, and 40% thinks the Flames will play better than 500. Nobody thought the Flames would catch fire and go on a big win streak, and 20% thought that the Flames would break even and get just barely at 500 so we're all over the map we're not sure what to expect well and based off their play it's kind of hard to determine what exactly the flames are going to do because they should be better than this but they're not so that's it they're making it hard for us yeah exactly so talking about the chicago thing we're going to make that our uh poll for the week if the flames trade with the senators who can you see coming back our way mike hoffman zach smith jean gabriel peugeot eric carlson somebody else or maybe the flames don't trade with ottawa so let us know what you think we'd love to hear everyone's thoughts and it's always fun as we get towards trade deadline to start thinking about what the flames might do matt's thinking it's going to be a big deal with the senators and as much as that'd be fun i'm not sure it'll help us but we'll see what happens well it it's always good to play nhl 2018 but in real life instead of on the computer screen so We'll see. Maybe that's how the Oilers are run. Somebody plays NHL in 2018 and then goes and does whatever the game says. Yeah. Oh, I'll give you all the draft picks for this random useless player. Sure. Awesome. In in the NHL, the difficulty is not set to beginner. Yeah. (laughs) Well, let's look ahead to the next week. The Flames are going on a road trip. They have uh, six games in 11 days, so pretty much a game every other day. The first half of this road trip will be this week, and we'll talk about it next week. Tomorrow night on the 6th of February, the Flames have a rematch against Chicago at the United Center. That's a 6.30 p.m. start. They have Wednesday off, and then they play a back-to-back against New Jersey and New York. Those are both 5 p.m. mountain starts, Thursday and Friday. Then they have a day off, and they're in Brooklyn to play against the Islanders. So four games, Chicago, New York, uh, New Jersey, and New York Islanders all on the road. What are you thinking, Matt? Uh, well, they just need points at this point, and because of their opponents, it doesn't matter if they're in overtime or not, uh, they just need to win, and I don't know. I I The nice th- thing is outside Chicago, like you said, they're all Eastern Conference teams, so we could give up a point to every team. Yeah. I'm going to have to go with, I think they'll win against Chicago, because the Blackhawks are basically a two-player team at this point. 
I'm gonna have to go with six points in hopes that they get six points. I, six of a possible eight. Yeah, I don't see I with how they're playing. I don't see them getting more than four, but six would be great. So who do you think they lose to in your six point scenario? Uh, I think they lose to New Jersey and the Islanders. Okay. Yeah, well, I can see that. That's what I'm expecting. I. It, I, if they get six points, I think they'll beat the Islanders, too. Surprisingly, New Jersey's hot. Yeah. That's another team that we didn't expect to do much, and they're looking good. I think the Flames will beat Chicago. I think they'll give up a point to Chicago, unfortunately. Uh, I think they'll get beat by the Devils, and I think they will beat the Rangers. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm pretty much the same as you. I think they'll beat the Rangers and lose to the Islanders. Yeah. So could be a rough swing through New York. Yeah. Well, it, they just need to get points. And hopefully the uh, Philadelphia Eagles winning the Super Bowl pumps Gaudreau up. So that way he's going to like score a hat trick against Chicago or something. But, uh, yeah, the Flames just need to get points at this point. Uh, they, they just need them. And yeah, every game's a must win. And it doesn't matter who or how; they just need two points each game. Where do you where do you play Riddick? Honestly, just the Rangers game. Honestly, yeah, I I'd almost start him against New Jersey, but yeah, the Rangers probably makes the most sense. Gulletson though, Smith probably plays all four. See, this is the thing, right? We're chasing that wild card spot, and as much as we say Smith needs a rest, Smith is the better goaltender. Yeah. So it's a catch-22. If the Flames weren't performing as poorly, we'd be playing Riddick a lot more. Yeah. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. I think the Flames... And it's interesting with the Devils. Uh, Eddie Lack has got called up to the NHL. Yeah, guess who we're facing. Well, Hit. I was going to say, do you put Lack versus Riddick? Yeah, well... Yeah, if Lack is the starter for that game, expect the, the Devils to shut the Flames out, just because. Either yeah, that or we'll score like seven goals on them, one or the other. Probably. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be one extreme or the other. Um, I think I would play Riddick, New Jersey, and New York Rangers. I'd give them the back-to-back. Because -back. looking ahead, I think Smith, I want him rested for the Boston and the Nashville game. But we'll see what happens. I think uh, I also think if you look into Riddick as a potential starter, that's a good way to test his workload. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt. Well, hopefully I'm sounding better next week so everyone can understand me. Well, that's difficult most of the time. <laughs> well, hopefully it's it's a little bit better. I will talk to you next week. Enjoy the first half of this road trip. Uh, have a good week. Get better. So that way, you know... We, we, you at least can be able to talk even just during your normal working hours and then you know for our show so i might have to mine the show next week oh that'll be fun for an audio show it'll be great fun oh yeah take care and right, as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.